package. So instead, you should create a different packages which in which you should follow a, a single responsibility for each package. So I think we do that in OOD. And yeah, we did in OOD, but if we don't follow that design which yeah. you taught us, like mm -hmm. to create each yeah. package. Instead, we just create uh, one package and all the file into the same package. So that's a bad design. So uh, this microservice designing is a similar kind of idea where you will create each microservice and it has a single responsibility. So as I have already mentioned, it's architectural style and it's used to structure an application as a collection of loosely coupled services. So uh, over here also I can relate this thing to the principles we learn in as a part of OOD and design pattern that we should always create a service, a service as loosely coupled services like high level components should depend on low level components and those two things should be dependent on interface so those, that's the way we used to design our uh, projects in OOD. So it's a similar kind of uh, things like not perfectly similar but you can uh, relate uh, that thing with this that we are creating a microservice which is loosely coupled so those two services instead of depending on each other uh, while uh, on, like in tight like instead of being tightly coupled and depending on each other they will just send some message and uh, they will work in that way like we have created last project in which we have created three servers like collaboration servers and uh, repository and the client server and all of these all of those three servers are talking with each other while sending different type of messages so that's that is a microservice right like a similar kind of architecture which we have created so uh, we can relate those things to this thing and how to decompose so there are two types of decomposition which you can follow first one is decomposed by business capability and decomposed by domain and over here we are going to follow a decompose by business capability so we have divided our whole website into different type of small small microservices and all, all of the microservices has their own business responsibility and their own uh, way of behaving when you call some of the microservices. So some of the services just uh, return some API responses where you will get the data and in some of the responses you will get the HTML views. So uh, that's how we are divided. Are you going to tell me what a DDD subdomain is? Oh, yeah, I forgot. So, uh, <coughs> It's like, uh, I forgot the full form of the DDD, but it's, uh, it's like dividing your whole website into subdomains. Like, uh, I can give an example for that. Uh, That's okay. Uh, you know, you've used a term there that wasn't explained. Yeah, I should have. And then you had trouble explaining it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sorry about that, yeah. So, uh, this is the actual diagram using which I can demonstrate uh, microservices in the simple terms. So uh, these are the three microservices which we have created in this diagram. So previously if you have created any simple website or any web application, you will put all this thing into one uh, package and you will deploy that whole website together. But over here we have divided the microservice into three parts where all of the three services can be deployable as a separate microservice or separate package on any of uh, any on different uh, platforms and each of the services has their own databases and this is the main shared, uh, storefront web app which is redirecting when a browser will try to access any of the microservices and there is other API gateway so this all the services have yeah, so this, all the services have a two ex, uh, two kind of uh, functionality. The first one is to uh, return uh, HTML view. Another is, is to return the data. So if any third party want to use your API gateway, or if you're creating any mobile application where you mostly use API to get your JSON data and to, view, to show the data on, uh, on your uh, Android phone. So... Uh, at the time you will use this functionality and get your REST data, get your data using REST API. While you're, if you're creating browser kind of application uh, on that type kind of uh, uh, business uh, uh, requirement, you can use the second kind of functionality which is provided by this microservices.
So why and how? So why we are uh, building the website using microservices and how we are going to do that? The first one is a why. So the first motivation behind using microservices is being friendly just to explore the microservices as a first one. But the second one is uh, you can actually divide your uh, whole uh, idea or the whole web application into different small, small application. And all of those application, all of those my application, all of the services are their self, uh, uh, like itself, those services are web application, some small web application. And all of them have some single responsibility. Like we are building a job board. So we have divided our service in a way that one service is just for our notification to handle notification services. Another one is just to uh, provide a messaging kind of services. The third one is just to, uh, to, uh, just to manage your connection on LinkedIn and to post and some profile management stuff. So that is the first thing. Second thing is uh, by building, if you come, if you are, uh, like if you're building some microservices, you come to know that building a notification service is very easy you, uh, by using Amazon Lambda. And if you are building a messaging service, then it's very easy by using a Node.js. So this is the uh, architecture style which you can follow and you can build your different services using different type of languages. And it will allow you to uh, create your application using different languages and deploy them as a separate container or as a separate uh, host. And you will create just one uh, main gateway which you will use to access all of those services. So there's a different type of forces which I'm going to explain because uh, microservices has a lots of design patterns. So if you follow one of the patterns, then for that patterns, there, uh, there are some set of forces which you uh, which will force you to uh, follow that pattern. So I'm going to explain on the next slide. Uh, just be on here. How to get the database consistency. Since I have told that each and every microservices has their own database. and uh, but there are some central databases which is being used by microservices. So the first one is how you're going to get that database consistency when the database is central, like all the microservices using the same database. And the third one is the communication style. So these communication styles are going to follow. So uh, I can answer a second question right now, something like how to get a database consistency. So since all of the microservices have services have their own responsibility, so you will create an uh, independent database for all the microservices. You will try to get independency for each and every microservices. But still, if you get some dependency on some central database, like uh, if you are doing authentication and you need some token kind of services where all of the microservices will use that database to get, to authorize the user when the user is trying to access that database. So those kind of small uh, uses you can do using central database, but mostly you should use independent database so you don't have to uh, think about the database consistency since it's this kind of architecture. And the third one is the communication styles, which I've already... Before you leave the database consistency, there's a another issue, I think, and that is that the, the microservices tend to use NoSQL databases. We are going to use a SQL in a, one of our microservices. Okay. The, I think that in general they tend to. Like, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying they have to. Yeah. But I think it's very common that yeah, so they'll use, use, they'll, uh, they'll no, use no, no SQL database like Mongo. Yeah. And no SQL databases give up consistency. They move consistency out. The application has to has to resolve There's the consistency in the data. Yeah, so. If you use SQL, then it, it will handle everything by itself. More or less. Yeah, yeah, more or less, but still, it, it yeah. has some features like the application and other features which yeah. you can use and... Yeah. Uh, the, just the table structure and the uh, use of relationships and stuff tends to make the data consistent. Yeah. We'll be showing example data. Yeah, we're showing example data. So, uh, uh, communication style. So, there are two types of communication which can happen in this type of architecture style. So, first one is when your client will try to access some of the microservices. And the second one is here some of the microservices are talking with each other. So that's the second type of communication. So you can uh, follow the same, same kind of communication uh, in both of those patterns, but uh, uh, 
uh, we had will we we have tried to make it different. So we'll try to uh, cover those things too into, into this as a part of this presentation. So deployment pattern. So these are the patterns which I was talking about. So, so each and every pattern has some different forces. So I'm going to upload this presentation, and these are actually all the links which you can just click and go to some pages which will show the what are the forces, what are the drawbacks, what are the benefits for each of these deployment patterns. So I can explain some of uh, them. So the service instance per host. So this is the one which we are going to follow where we are going to host each of our services on different instances and service instance per VM. So you will actually spawn some virtual machine on one of big server and you will uh, host your microservices on those VMs. The fourth one is service instance per container. Container. So container is basically the Docker. So you will do Dockerize your application. You will host your application on one of the server. So let's say uh, my one of the microservices is uh, built using C Sharp. So it, it needs .NET framework. And uh, uh, some other microservices like some Node.js microservices, which uh, needs to download Node.js packages. So I will create a Dockerize those application. I'll I'll mention those those dependencies into my Docker package. And when you will uh, uh, deploy those microservices is any in any of the server, then it will automatically download all the dependencies. So the basic motivation behind this kind of Dockerization is. Uh, you can run uh, your uh, any of the product to any of the environment, but it will behave in similar way. Like you are working on some product on in the development environment, and then you are deploying that into an, uh, your actual environment. So uh, if you have Docker as your application, then you are deploying it, and it will behave in similar way. You you will not face any kind of environmental issues. So you will you can. Uh, uh, use Docker, uh, you can Dockerize your application and you can use this pattern. And this is a serverless deployment. So most of the people use Amazon Lambda to get the server style serverless deployment where you don't have to think about server. You will just write some code into Amazon Lambda, like if you want to use Node.js or Python. So they provide some uh, coding platform so I, I I don't know the name of that thing but uh, they will provide you some text uh, page where you can write your code and you can uh, create uh, your lambdas which will uh, like you can create two or three lambdas like one lambda will in, instantiate another lambda and another lambda will instantiate another lambda so that's the way it works like it's actually a lambda like C++ lambda the way it works like one lambda one function can ins uh, invoke another function so it's a similar kind of functionality that's why they call it lambda but you don't have to think about any kind of server dependency. You will just write your code like they have functionality to write C sharp, Java, all the kind of languages. So you can use that to uh, So so could you go back to <laughs> Yeah. So have you made up your mind this the deployment pattern or patterns you're going to use? Yes, yeah, so we are going to use a server instance per host. Yes, we are okay. uh, because uh, uh, the forces which we have like to use different type of languages and to uh, get a communication between all the instance. All so the my instance. guess is you're probably actually going to use one and two. Uh, okay. no, likely, we, likely, likely, likely. Yeah, but yeah, well, I you might have, have some subdomains that are that would be likely. Yeah, I, you know, like you yeah. haven't built it yet, so you don't know for sure. Yeah. But I would think. Yeah. If you're using likely. third party libraries, third party then libraries, yeah, then we might be using it. that pattern. But yeah. I'm also planning to uh, use this serverless deployment for one of our microservices, like notification services, where we'll just create one small lambda, and for each of the notification, we'll create a queue, and it will put the message to that queue, and uh, yeah. that notification lambda will put. Yeah. That uh, that notification feed into all the users' notification. So there's one small lambda which we can create and explore this serverless deployment. Just a, a point of presentation. It, it would be nice if on your slide you had made check marks for what. So here's options. Here here's the here's the pantheon of possibilities, and it would be nice to say check or check check. Those are the ones, here's what we're going to focus on, just to get us oriented into where you're going. Yes? That so, makes sense. this is the one which we are going to follow. So, I was coming to that. Yeah. So, uh, we are going to follow the single service instance per host. 
and these are our forces like service are written using variety of languages frameworks and framework versions and each service consists of multiple service instance and to good and availability so these are all the forces which uh, is uh, like forcing us to use this microservice this pattern like service instance per host and uh, uh, there are some of them is uh, are very important like you want deployment to be reliable you must deploy the application as cost cost effectively as possible because when you are changing in one of the microservices like if i want to update something in my messaging service and if i build my whole website using monolithic structure then i will change that part and i'll deploy my whole website but if i follow this kind of structure then i can just deploy that messaging service and uh, i don't have to do anything with other services and it will not affect if i have done some changes which can break my microservice micro, uh, messaging service but it will not affect the other service it, it, it will work in the same way so uh, these are the and the, the fourth one is also important service instances need to be isolated from one from one another so uh it's so that's easier to say than do right so you're going to have a messaging service yeah, yeah. so every other service depends on your messaging service no, no. it's like isolation between all the services i mean that uh, if i am like uh, the way I build my messaging service, so no, like not any other, like any other service is not going to talk to that service. If I want to isolate any microservices, uh, messaging. What, what do you mean by messaging services? Just the mess Facebook messaging service. Like LinkedIn messaging, LinkedIn you can say that you can the send a message. And communication channel. Okay. Uh, that is handled by HTTP side messages. Okay. So we are not. So those are creating different processes there. being served, and they are communicating using HTTP. Yeah. So it's not like we are. Not Following any chatting uh, framework or web socket, web socket or anything, it's just a database where we are putting the messages. So if you send me a message, then I put that message into my database. So, let's go to the next one. So, uh, what are the benefits using microservices? The first one is enables a continuous delivery and deployment of large and complex application. So, as I already explained, that if you are creating a large and complex application, you can divide it into smaller services and smaller business responsibilities and you can create a uh, microservice for each of the business responsibilities. Second one is each microservice are relatively small. So this one is very important that each microservice is relatively small. It's like uh, Jeff Bezos has mentioned one once that uh, uh, if you are working on microservices and you have one team on microservices, so microservice, then you should feed that team using just two pizzas. It should be that small. Uh, 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 so there's two pizzas. Uh, yeah, there's two pizzas. Two pizza roll. Good. <laughs> uh, and improve the fault isolation. So this one is very uh, good thing. Like uh, uh, as I already mentioned about my messaging part. Like if you're if I'm changing, if I'm modifying something in my messaging service, uh, I just have to deploy that service. I have to do the tinkering with just that service. I don't. I'm not going to touch any of the other services. It will provide you a good uh, fault isolation. Fourth one is eliminates any long term commitment to a technology stack. So uh, the pattern which I'm going to follow that in, in which you can use any languages for any microservices. So you don't have to provide a long term commitment to technology stack. Like you can see that uh, on each day there are new technologies are coming up. Like first it was a Java, then and then Node JS, then Python. Then each of the new technologies comes up. And all of these technologies have their own benefit. So if you see that your service is not doing well, it's not doing well in the market, and you want to change your micro your services, and you want to change the language so it, it can perform better, then this provides you that uh, feasibility to implement or to do those kind of stuff in your my other application. Uh, let you go and change the, that one bottleneck yeah. Without tearing apart the whole system. Whole system yeah. yeah. So this is our project design and the tasks which we are going to do as a part of this project. So this is the main web API gate gateway which you have to touch if you want to access any of the microservices. And these are the, all the micro different microservices. So this is our main central database which we have created. As of now, we have just thought about 
to use it for authentication like whenever uh, you will get authenticated your to token will get stored into a user database and after that whenever you are trying to uh, <laughs> access any of the other microservices you have to get authorized using that token and we'll use that database where your token has been stored and you will get authorized to use any of the microservices. And uh, But the job board, for example, would hold its own data? You were saying that a lot of these services will hold their own data. Yeah, so yeah, all of these microservices have their own data. Like if I talk about that web live feed notification, like wall or live feed, where wall is like uh, in the Facebook wall, you can see all the posts. <laughs> so this will has its own data where it, uh, it, it will be just designed to store the different type of posts. If I talk about the profile management, then the, I can just simply create a user table where I'll, I can have all the information about the users. And I'll, I'll just store the pro, uh, profile related data to, to this profile management. And this job board where I can just store all the jobs which is being posted by any of the users. So all of this microservices has, has their own data and there is a central database which I'm going to use just for authentication as of now. And what another service, another thing I want to mention is this notification microservices. So you can see that uh, it's very complex but uh, you can see that all of the microservices are connected to this notification services. You can see that. All of the microservices are connected to the uh, notification services because whenever you do some changes and you have enabled that functionality to notify other person, then uh, like uh, I'm a part of this job board and I have some 300 connections and I'm posting something, right? So uh, if I'm posting something, then I'll be over here, wall or live with notification, where I will post something. And when I post something, it will create one some small feed message and that those that feed message will come over here. And that notification microservices will access my, uh, uh, what I say, access my connection, like I have a 300 connection, and will put that feed message into all of those 300, notifi 300 persons a notification. So if that them. one goes down, it won't take down the whole system? So Over here, if that one disappears, uh, the wall can work just fine without that? Yeah. So the It'd way I... interesting to see how that really works out. Yeah. So the way I'm, I've planned is to just to create... A, this is just a small uh, sub, uh, service. And it will going to handle lots of stuff because all of the so services... So you can post messages to it, but you don't care whether it actually gets it. Yeah. Like I have put some posts and if you don't get one or two notifications, you don't care about that. If you that. don't connect, you just don't worry about it. Yeah. So yeah. it will just come over here to put that message and that's it. And over here, I'm going to create some blocking queue kind of stuff yeah. where all of the threads will just fetch one message yeah. and it will just put those messages into all the connections. Yeah. So uh, that's the way it's going to work. And uh, yeah. This monitoring and testing service. Yeah. Uh, the previous one. Yeah. So this is the monitoring and testing service. So this is for ourselves. Where this service will talk with each of these microservices, and it will monitor the health and all the things like testing and everything about these microservices. Why would it talk to anybody beside the notification service? Sorry? Why would it talk to anybody beside the notification service? Oh. The monitoring and testing service. It is going to talk with each and every services, like all the services, because we have we want to check the health. It won't be the, like, it's not depending on the other services. Other services. What, it, what it's doing is just sending a message and placing that yeah, message. That's why I'm Sharing asking, why, do, why didn't it just talk to the notification? Because yeah. you can send you can send uh, health and testing messages to the notification service and just have him use the notification service. How do you use that? Yeah. Can you I just a thought. Can no, you just no, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but can you repeat the question? Can you, uh, uh, can you just repeat the question? That's what Kunal is asking. Okay. So, say it again, I didn't hear it all. Can you just repeat this. the question? Could I yeah. So, uh, why would you, why would the monitoring and testing service 
talk to anybody beside the notification service. Okay, so notification <laughs> microservices is just handling uh, uh, my well, but maybe that's just definition, right? Everybody can talk to notification service. Yeah. So now, why would we make monitoring and testing service talk so, to everybody when we already have that everybody talking to the notification service? So the, I have a two points over here. The first one is a single responsibility, which I will talk about. Like this service just should just deal with notification. He's just holding the notifications and giving them up, right? <laughs> yeah, so yeah. whoever needs them. So, even though you do that, you haven't changed his responsibility. Now the responsibility of monitoring and testing is to grab the notifications he wants. No, uh, no the, it's okay. Yeah, you know you don't have to. That's just yeah. a thought. Just the uh, the way monitoring and testing works is like it will send. It will just see whether each of the services alive or not. Like by sending a heartbeat or something. It's kind of probe. So why does you know you got the notification here? But you could have heartbeat messages go into notification. And yeah. All these so one look at them. Yeah. So one thing is that one thing uh, is so here is uh, <coughs> this will talk to notification service whenever someone will, if someone is going to post or something over here. Yeah. Otherwise, this communication channel we are not going to use that. Uh, or this will going to talk when someone do some change in their profile. Like if I join some new job, then I'll update yeah. something and. That I will talk to over here, yeah. but and it's not continuously communication between those two microservices. It's just doing a, a post request. It's not actually depending on that service. Also, also the way request. in which you told probably if notification microservices down, then they don't have to uh, any other option, right? If they do the way you. Well, did. they claim that they can operate just fine without notification services. No, I mean the way you said, like when monitoring and testing service has to depend upon notification microservice. If that's down. Then, then you're not testing and monitoring, that's all. Everything else is running. Yeah, then, so that service should be down, right? The notification will be down. Oh, I anyway, so you know, I didn't mean to, um, uh, that's okay. You don't get to know which one is running then. Why don't we, why don't we just, okay. Just <laughs> a little bit. Skip so, it. over here we'll get page not found or the data will not found. Otherwise, everything will work. So this is this kind of notification you can use uh, in the Facebook, like, you can see that this one will be the different uh, whole microservices, and if you if this is not working, you will click over here. We'll see something page not found, data not found. Everything else will work. Yeah. So, yeah. Can go to the next one. Yeah, so uh, we are going to use OAuth 2.0 for authentication. So there are some different services and different OAuth authentication servers available which you can use. So uh, I'll just first uh, try to explain the authentication flow in the OAuth 2.0 and then I'm going to explain what we are planning to do. So this is the resource owner, so this is the person. And there is some client third party application. Like, uh, you're using some application and like kind of you're using some LinkedIn kind of uh, application and you are trying to sign in into LinkedIn using Google credential or Facebook credentials. So you can assume that there's a LinkedIn uh, Android application which you're opening your phone and you try to connect to the service. And uh, after that you have decided to sign in using Google sign in. So this is the authorization, authorization server and you will try to sign in using Google, you will request authorization code, but then that uh, Google sign in server will send you some page where you have to uh, enter your login credentials the way we used to do that. So you will get that page, you will enter your credentials and grant the accent, grant the consent. So actually the LinkedIn don't have your credentials, it has just has a token. So when you will, uh, uh, enter your credential and grant consent, the authorization server will give the authorization code to this client third party application. So now client third party application have the authorization code, it still don't have that particular token. So now uh, when it will redirect to the client third party application, it has a token and after that the token exchange will be happen between the client third party application and the authorization server. So. After that, that client third party application try to uh, access that resource server, which is over here. And before doing that, 
it has to access the token. So over here we are doing the token access on base of the authorization code. So this client will give the authorization code and then authorizer will say that, okay, yeah, I, uh, you are authorized to uh, access that resource and it will get the token. And after, like after getting the token, that client third party application will uh, access this resource server. And the big thing or the important thing about this token is it will get refreshed after some time. So when you will get the token over here, you will get some string in the JSON which says some ID or some token number and it will have that expiry time like after this time, after this much of time it will get expired. After that time it will get expired and after that time it will get refreshed using authorization server. So, so this is how uh, it's, this thing is worked. So how you can build this kind of functionality. So the thing is whenever you are creating any application, let's say about you are creating any Android application, you want OAuth 2.0. So there are some uh, servers available online which you can use like Google authentication which you can use where uh, uh, you have to uh, register your application first. You have to, uh, uh, like after registering your application, you will get client ID. So client ID is unique for each application. So like I have created my application and they have provided me a client ID. So client ID is a public number which, you, uh, which will be used by all the application. And uh, you will also get client secret, which is not a public thing. So uh, that client secret will be used during this process of authentication. Like when you send, uh, uh, it, will be, it will get used over here. When you try to access the service and when you try to request authorization code at the time you will send that client secret with that. So this design seems proper but it has some issues with client secret IDs like uh, uh, there are some application or there are some uh, web application kind of uh, application which you build and you cannot put your client secret on the client side like you have created an Android application the code, the code is with the client you cannot provide client secret with that. If you created a single page application, like uh, currently there is very it's trending to create a uh, Angular JS application with a single page application. So your whole code is with the client, so you cannot put client secret in that. But if you create a simple kind of web page server where all the codes reside into server side, on those kind of uh, areas you can use a client ID secret. So currently there are two kinds of uh, uh, OAuth 2 functionality which is uh, get used by different type of companies but most of the companies now are uh, stop using a client ID secret because it uh, it's not uh, like most of the application are uh, their single page application or Android application so it's not feasible to use a client ID secret in current days so most of the companies are just stop using those client ID secret so you can click on this OAuth 2.0 So uh, you can go to this link uh, from this uh, uh, presentation and it's very simple OAuth 2 simplified where you can get, get very easy description of OAuth 2, how it works and how you can use it. So we are basically planning to create, uh, create our own OAuth 2 server which we can use. We are not sure that how much it, time it's going to take. But we have planned to create our own OAuth 2.0 server instead of using any other authentication service. And that OAuth 2.0 server we, we, we are going to use for our, uh, like to authenticate our uh, uh, job board. So, go to the next one. So, from this slide, we are going to start our different micro services. So, the first one is a messaging service. So, for that messaging service, we are going to use Node.js and MongoDB as a backend. And how you're going to deal with that is uh, whenever any user will get registered with our website, it will have some unique ID. Like, like all the website you will get some unique ID, right? So we'll use that unique ID to create the conversation. So over here I mentioned that for each user use a conversation, we'll create a different collection which, we, which stores the whole conversation. So like me and Kunal is talking and I have a user ID, unique user ID, Arpit and Kunal has a unique user ID, Kunal. So we are going to use that two unique ID to create a different collection 
then we'll we'll going to stop the whole conversation so what benefits we are getting by doing that is instead of creating just one message class and putting all the conversation into that class and fetching or querying all the conversation according to your request we have just created this different collection database for all of the conversation so uh, if you want to fetch the conversation bit if i want to fetch the conversation between arpit and kunal so i'll just go to that collection and i'll just uh get that json data from that collection and i'll just view uh, i'll just render that instead of doing any query thing so it will be a lot a lot faster and uh, yeah as i mentioned name of the collection will be combination of sender and receiver's unique id and the body contains message timestamps and status so all of the data will be in json so in the json we will going to store the message strings timestamps and status like seen or unseen and uh, this is a small uh Uh, code snippet. I just put like how you should uh, uh, config the MongoDB. So this is this will be the configuration in the MongoDB. Like you can uh, uh, put the destination. You can uh, uh, so you can put the uh, DB path like where all the file will going to get stored because MongoDB, as you know, as, as a documentation database, so all the all the data will be, will get documented into this MongoDB. So this is the storage path. This is the port which. You're going to use, and this is the replication. Like how much replication do you want? Replicable one, replicable two, replicable three. So there's a small simple that. So wall or live feed services. So this is the basic service which all the social media uh, platform nowadays are providing. Like uh, you can post something, you can you have your own wall, and you can see your post. So I don't think so. I have to explain much about the wall. But yeah, we are going to use text text like Python and Flask libraries for that. And the sub problems which we are going to uh, uh, face during this development is first is a data model. So we need some schema to store user and feed object. Uh, more importantly, there is lots of trade offs when we try to optimize the system for read or write, and I explain. So. Uh, We are going to explain those things in the next slides, but the basic thing I'm, which I want to explain over here is the data model. So, by the word data model, I want to explain that how I'm going to store those thing uh, into my database. Like, if you are creating any post, so I'm going to store your data which you have put into that post. If you are putting any image, and I have to put that image into some separate library, and I have to uh, include the link into my database. So those are the simple things I have to put. So th these are the normal thing everyone can expect that. But the uh, the important thing is ranking. Like uh, there are one user who is putting thousands of posts in each day, and there is one user who is just putting one or two posts. And if I just uh, sort those things using uh, timestamp, like I have a third, I have a three connection in my job board, and one user is putting thousand posts, and one user is putting just two posts. And if I just fetch all the posts and put into one thing, and I just sort it using timestamp, and if I render on my wall, then I'll just get hundred posts of that user, and that other user's post will be at the down or the end of those posts. So I need some ranking mechanism where I'll just using which I can rank the post uh, on base of importance, on base of some other factors, and uh, I can sort the post using those mechanism. So. Uh, We are not sure still that what we are going to store is store in the data model, but still we are exploring those things about the ranking mechanism, like what Facebook is using. <coughs> Facebook is using a lot, uh, uh, but still we are trying to follow some things or some factors which Facebook is considering by by ranking. So that is the data model where we will use the ranking. We will will uh, uh, put some information about that ranking. And those ranking information will also get used while putting a feed, like by putting a notification, because as I explained about the post, the same thing applies to the notification. Because when you see the notification, and if I put the hundred notification of just one user that this user post a hundred post, so it will not be visible or no one is going to uh, like, no one going to like it, right? So I can use that same thing while uh, 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 ranking my feeds and the third. Uh, So that is feed publishing. The publishing can be trivial where there are only few hundreds of users, but can be costly when there are millions or even billions of users. So there is a scale problem here. So uh, 
I think I explained about this uh, using feed ranking where you can use some ranking and uh, you can scale your website. So the biggest problem in this application is it seems like a simple that you are just putting a post, you are rendering a post according to your, your query. You are uh, uh, viewing job uh, jobs on using job board microservice. You are, uh, you are doing not notification using notification services. But the biggest problem over here is with all the microservices about the scaling because there are lots of users who will going to use this kind of website and if the traffic is more and the data is more then you have to have come up with something using which you can rank your things, you can sort your things, you can give some important information to the user and you can reduce those or you can remove those uh, unuseful information. So everything is at the end come up to the uh, scaling. Like if you open that notification button, you will just want to see your five or six recent notification instead of all the notification which you haven't seen, right? So uh, we still are trying to figure out like what we can use as a feed <coughs> ranking and uh, like how you're going to rank those things. But at the end, like I can say that we are going to, uh, obviously going to use a paging because uh, whenever you will open your notifications or whenever you open your jobs list or whenever you will open your uh, wall you will just see a 10 or 15 and as as you will keep scrolling down you will keep getting new post and new notification so that is the one way we can solve that thing so but it's not still a proper scaling which we want for the website so we are still Before you start the slide uh, the time is half gone for the class okay Okay, and uh, Colonel and Gua have to talk, so okay. I think we got to... Yeah, so the from one. this slide, the Colonel is going to... So should I move it faster? Or a little faster, <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't <laughs> like you to be uh, worried too much about the time, but I do want... If, if Gua doesn't talk, then we're going to start... Well, you have explained I tried to make a smooth transition. I don't I try to make it transition as smooth as I can because you're told that you shouldn't go just straight with the microservice. Yeah. So but Yeah. yeah. No, I like what so you I did. did. Yeah. Just the timing yeah. So I'm just gonna go through a list of tools and top technologies which we use. So the first is a Python programming language and uh, Flask is a library which is basic. Speak a little louder. Uh, okay. There's a mic there you can, yeah. if you want to use the mic. It's fine. Thanks. Okay, so we'll, uh, this is a list of uh, tools and technologies which we'll be using. And uh, the first is the Python programming language. And it has a library called Flask, which basically allows us to serve our website. And it's, uh, it allows us to uh, respond to HTTP requests. And uh, then the other library is a CSV file generator, which basically allows us to build a list of a st uh, list of data, list of strings, or cl any structure which we define, and allows us to process that data much easily compared to other libraries which we have, other like, languages. So Flask is, a, as I mentioned, Flask is a micro web framework written in Python and based on uh, a toolkit provided by Workgroup and a template engine called Jinja2. Then the second, uh, second, lang uh, second uh, Languages Node, it's based on JavaScript. It's an open source cross-platform JavaScript runtime environment for executing JavaScript code on server side. And third is C++ Tiny HTTP Server. So uh, this is based on Professor's uh, OD sockets version. So I'll be using that for um, building my monitoring service. And the next is MongoDB, of course, and uh, it's an OSQL database and it's free open source. And it's based, it's document oriented database. So I'll be using this as well. And the communication between different services will be JSON style format. So all your communications are going to be JSON packets? Yeah. Body, it's, like the you're body accessing, will be it's like you're accessing some uh, APIs because this is actually microservices. Mm -hmm. So, like the way you access API. Yeah. So you would just do a post request some with some JSON. You just do a get request or a post yeah. request, depending on what you want. Sense. And uh, can you open the code? Simple. Yeah. I just go through some code in Node.js and Python. So it's I'll show you how easy it is. So this is a Node.js example. 
This uh, this script basically this has the dependencies Express and WS. WS is for web sockets and Express is for building APIs. So uh, as you can see, I create I created a, con a static uh, a singleton object of this for the, for app which is called app of this Express module, and it basically allows me go down. Basically allows me to handle requests, get and post requests. As you can see, app dot get. And this is the URL, and uh, so this is the for, this is the local host, whichever port I'm using, local host 8000. This will be the response which is being sent. And if I search for users, which if probably I have a service in my uh, in my web application where I need the list of users who are uh, who are part of my website, this will return me a JSON object with a list of users. We go down. Um, so then, the, then we can search user by IDs. Maybe my microservices, one of my microservices knows a specific ID, and then I can access the, the, the user details using yeah. that ID. Then the comments, I can just go through the comments, and this is a, this is basically similar to Link. How what I'm doing it? It's like I'm searching for a specific user ID for comments of a user ID, so it's looking for that user ID and returns me the comments which are associated with the user ID. And I'm just hosting it. This server is I got from the WebSockets module, and this is I'm hosting it at a zero zero. It's listening at port a zero zero, and uh, okay. so very can rest, you go up? Can you go very up? restful style. Yeah, can you go up? No, can you go up? Just no. these are just the classes. Right now I have static database, but this can be MongoDB instance. Uh, I can be hosting a MongoDB instance, and, and I can be getting this these uh, list of uh, start, uh, data from my MongoDB instance. So I'm create, I just create a class comment and user up here. Go up. Yeah, so just giving you an idea. So yeah, this is if, you, if I run this script, it's very easy. I can just install Node in my laptop and run Node script name of the script and it will serve it. Then the the next is a demo is the Python demo. So similar to Node, uh, it has the library which uh, which serves this uh, the script and uh, it's called Flask and uh, <coughs> so the, again I'm creating an instance app and then I'm as uh, if you go down just go down yeah so these are this was for uh, one of my services for hosting events one of we have one of our services which host events so what it does is it looks for I can query which event whichever information with all the attributes of that event and I can use those de details for in my microservices. So basically, just doing a GET request, getting some information. So you can just guess how the microservices are being built, right? They are just wrappers around some database, MongoDB database, and I'm just uh, doing a GET request or a POST request and communicating throughout my services. So uh, let's just go to the next slide. So, so the first service is the monitoring and visualization service. So this is based just a tool which allows me to check up on my services, log my log my services, see how they are operating, because they might be operating on some other virtual machine, right? They they could be in some somewhere, they could be located somewhere else, and I might know I might not know what is happening what is happening inside uh, the service itself. So this is basically allows me to monitor them and get details. So uh, I, we are thinking of implementing this in using uh, C++, uh, a tiny HTTP server. It, uh, we already have an implementation of that professor demonstrated in class. And so these are the different services associated with this service. So first is the health check, which what, what it does is test all the services by executing test case for each services. So I'll, I'll just build one test case for each service and just run them, execute, and if the test response is correct, I'll just put a tick mark, this, this works fine. And I'll do that for every service associated and hosted in my application. And the next is the net network data. You can uh, you can get the network data by using APIs, and uh, you can see how much data is being sent, how much data is being received. So that that just that's just giving me more analysis data. Mm -hmm. I can I can see what's happening inside my services. The next step is visualization. So the, I I build a wrapper class for uh, basically the is basically building tools for visualizing data through, uh, throughout my services. 
and logging is it's more challenging because it's it's not just one uh, project right and you can you cannot have just one package which ha which has dependency with each project and you can just know what uh, you can just log uh, each process each event and uh, and display it so you, instead of doing that we have this uh, logging tool which basically I'll explain about that later in the next slide so next slide so why do we need it so it uh, why do we need monitoring as a service so it has brought up new challenges because every service is uh, is separated it's hosted in a different uh, port uh, they communicate using HTTP style messages so we need to observe them and it's more challenging to observe all these services compared to a monolithic project structure. So the I next, think it's easier in Microsoft services because they're, they're broken I mean, apart. Yeah. They yeah. have interfaces, and so yeah. So it's newer, so it, it's more challenging because it's yeah. new. We know already yeah. how yeah. to do that because it's been there for yeah. so long. But I think in a, in a, when you're all done, mm -hmm. you'll yeah. say this is easier, yeah. more flexible, yeah, more powerful. I'm going to go to one of the ones later. So. It gives us observability in our system and helps us to discover, understand, and address issues to minimize the impact on the business. Next slide. So this is one of the approaches, how to do logging, distributed tracing. What it does is it shares context between different services. So it propagates trans transactions from distributed services and gains the information from cross-process communication. So it basically propagates a request from throughout through each of the services, and it shares context and it uh, uh, basically what it does is it, uh, it it logs every event that is happening like if uh, if if i'm accessing some uh, if i'm calling a function it will save that it will add that to my message and uh, uh, that's basically how it works by collecting spans events with the error flags we can have an error tracker which with only one instrumentation and multiple tracer backends. In this way, we don't have to deal with the performance overhead. So what it means is, this logging service can, can be an overhead, right? It could be causing a lot of problems with the if I run it with each service. So instead of doing that, what we do is we can have uh, we can set up one server for doing all of this monitoring and logging. One server handles for every service. That's what I mean. Interesting. If you have the time, so what you, it's clear that you're separating out into these separate services, you know, you're, you're, you're dividing up the CPU cycles across these, that's great, but on the other hand, you've got a lot of communication overhead, it'd be interesting if you could get a handle on yeah. it. We can try to make it as low as possible. Yeah. That, that depends on the design. Yeah. We have to, if we spend more time, it would be better. How it looks. So, I have one question over here about the tracing the information from each of the microservices. There are two types of communication which is possible. The first one is all of the microservices are telling the monitor that we are alive. Another one is monitor will ask each and every server, are you alive? Are you alive? For each, like for some period of time. Like after each period of time, some often, what I say, yeah, some frequently, frequency, like two seconds or three seconds. What, what should be better, like, to... So, if you have each one, uh, it's hard to, you know, so you'll probably get a lot more notifications going on. If the service is polling, you know, you can give him a fixed time when he goes around and polls. Yeah. You know, so probably the traffic's going to be lower. I think doing it, doing it once a day is fine. Refreshing it. Running it once a day. Yeah. That's fine. Because and what I was planning is like if we get that that kind of functionality that we can actually detect this server is down or this server is gone, we can instantiate from a new server using by sending some message like oh. Amazon is doing currently, oh, yeah. elastic bounding or something. So can we do that kind of thing using this monitoring tool or is not possible? Yeah. 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 Uh, but there's also, you know, if uh, Another, suppose a service goes down and another service is trying to use it, uh, can't use that because he's down, he could send a message to the 
you know, in those yeah. exceptional circumstances. You mean if uh, if the HTTP response is zero with a minus one, then it can send a notification to the monitoring yeah. server and just yeah. cross it, cross it down. Yeah. So, yeah, so the this is the visualization tool. So these are some uh, libraries, JavaScript libraries, which are very popular. You might you might have heard of them. Dart.js and dt.js. So dt.js is a JavaScript-based visualization engine that will render interactive charts and graphs based on the data. So the, this is one form of graph visualization, and there are a lot of other forms. So I've used it in the past, and I think it's very useful for analyzing data. And you can do graph visualization, which uh, the those remember graph visualization tool, which Professor showed in summer project. You might have seen. So it was based on D three. So that's another line. So don't know it. Okay. Uh, so the, so the next service is the profile creation service, and uh, this is the step. The, this is the first step, which basically happens when user signs in and enters credentials, details about his uh, name, prof uh, all the other profile information. So we we are running it. We we are thinking of running it in Java, Spring, and MVC, and uh, using a MongoDB instance. Then uh, basically, what it does, it'll make it easy for us to build the authentication server. And just yeah. we'll be running it on one uh, Java Spring MVC application, and it'll be, it'll run two servers. One will be authentication server, and the other will be. Uh, so is it. that service to totally Java? So you're going to use the Apache components or something to talk to, to do yeah, this? Yeah, for hosting Tomcat, yeah, Apache Tomcat. It, in these days, what happens is when you create. I don't a, know the yeah. Tomcat, but it, just using just using the uh, HTTP client, HTTP server out of the Apache components. Yeah, yeah. that is one way of doing it. But in uh, whenever we set up a project, and these days in Java or Spring MVC, what happens is it sets up a server itself. You yeah. don't have to do anything. And it'll create. Uh, Controllers for you and index your HTML. So it's very probably easy. a lot heavier weight than yeah. all the other guys. Yeah, probably. Be interesting to. So we uh, we are focused mm -hmm. on the authentication part. So we think we have that's why we are thinking sure. using Java. So the Spring Boot, which we want to use mostly, is because like in Spring Boot, you can go to the website, you can uh, check my whatever you want. Like I want Apache Tomcat, I want mm -hmm. this and that. Yeah. You can download the sample project. Yeah. You can directly work on that. Uh, these are the attributes: username, image URL, profile image, email, contacts, links. Links is a list of all his uh, work, probably uh, GitHub or other links. One really interesting part of what you're doing is that you are marshaling resources from a whole bunch of different technologies and making them work together. And, you know, that'll be interesting for us and look good on your resume. So. Uh, next, next is the uh, next is the job board service. So I'm going to say the same thing to you that I said. To, uh, we got to give what? Yeah, and uh, go this native card. So, so. Uh, this is Node.js backended SQL. We chose SQL because it allows allows it allows filtering for, for like your job has many attributes. Like if it's an entry level job or if it's it has a lot of filters which you want to use. So it, SQL will make it easier, I guess. That's why we used SQL. So next. And then next is the push notification service. Uh, so the, there are two. Uh, we'll be using Python and uh, MongoDB backend. So uh, there are two things which we have to take care of. So it's be, we are notifying observers who are subscribed to other users. And the other thing which we are doing is sending tech events which are happening, notifications about tech, tech events and other things which are happening in the website. So we'll be so, uh, processing strings Lang uh, natural language is very easy using Python. So that's why we use Python in this, for this service. And uh, we, have a, we have a library called Panda and CSV library, which allows us to process our data and perform mapping, which basically it'll look at, look at terms which we, are, which, which we are looking for and just process the strings and uh, put, push those strings in an array. And basically, it allows us to, it basically makes the, our job a whole lot easier so than if we are some, on some other platform. And the attributes are observed in the notification day description. So the tech event organizer service again, Node.js backend, MongoDB instance, and create 
uh, it'll have attributes like venue, time, type, and we'll have locate. I've done this in the past. It's based on it'll use Google Maps API, API for recommending events based for the events which are happening nearby. User has his own latitude, longitude, location, and all those events which are happening, they have their own location. So it's we can recommend you, you uh, all the events which are nearby to the user, and these are the attributes. And yeah, this is how the, we are splitting the tasks between us. Arpit is going to manage, going to put his whole priority with the authentication server. I try to help him. And then the message service, live feed, profile creation. He'll try to finish uh, the other small services within the next uh, two, three weeks. And uh, similarly, with me, uh, the main priority will be monitoring tool and building the other services, which, which we'll try to finish it within the next two weeks. Focus on these two tasks, monitoring and uh, authentication. authentication later on. Thank you. Do you have any questions you can ask? Terrific. I don't think we have time for questions, so we've got to give Joe some time. But that was a nice presentation. I enjoyed it, guys. I, I thought I was a third. Uh, you are. Uh, so Christina couldn't present today. Oh, that's OK. So you're up. Yeah, sure. If you were the third, you wouldn't present today, because... Uh, yeah, I guess so. Uh, <laughs> Good thing Christina had to delay. Christina, are you here? No, she's not here. Yeah, brief comment. So, uh, you know, SMA project design, so how does it relate to microservices? Is there any relation to that? The way we design our SMA Which project are you talking about? The, the, the uh, final project? Yeah, the final project. Uh, you could have done... We didn't particularly, but you could have done things with microservices. We're getting close. I mean, you know, the asynchronous communication among those federation guys, it's moving toward that microservices idea. But microservices is really a matter of scale. They're smaller, you know. So to do that with microservices, you'd really be dividing up each of those servers into sets of microservices. Yeah, I'm, I just realized I don't have some, but I can do this. Okay. Uh, what do you need? A, 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 okay. Because I have a dongle. If you have a display port, I can get you on the air. I think I just forget the, uh, okay. it, this one needs right. a one station. Which I... Now you got to connect to, you want PC. Right. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Ming Xunguo, uh, and the uh, project I picked is topic cross-platform GUI using Chrome and Tiny HTTP server. It's a rather uh, mouthy topic, but the uh, uh, the general uh, gist of the project is is uh, relatively simple. So, in a uh, one sentence form, it exploits the browser rendering facility to create cross-platform GUI with less effort. Uh, that still doesn't say much, but what does that mean is uh, consider you're uh, developing a, a GUI application or application for a specific GUI. Uh, normally, what you do is you uh, have a specific platform in mind because normally uh, each platform has different uh, development tools. For instance, uh, Windows has WPF. Uh, I know uh, Android has uh, Android Studio and stuff. Uh, so uh, each uh, is different, but if you're considering uh, browsers, they're they're displaying pages from the web. The the, the page itself doesn't it's it's not a specific target for each platform. The browser does the uh, the job that uh, displaying the information. And you can interact with the uh, the web page. 
the, uh, if we can somehow turn the browser into a GUI, uh, that will make the cross-platform development for applications simpler. And that's what uh, this does. Um, so this is a uh, really uh, crude uh, point that I made. Uh, because this is targeted for, the first uh, question I asked myself for this uh, project is that what difference does it make for this, uh, for this project approach and a web application? And, uh, and the, the answer is, it's not targeted for a web application. We're, we're not trying to uh, create a web application. We're trying to create an application for GUI and uh, uh, for cross-platform cross, uh, uh, uses. And uh, this is a, uh, somehow a, a way to make it so that it will take less effort to make it cross-platform. Um, and uh, so uh, in a, uh, in a uh, lo local set settings, which means that you're, we're not assuming that application need, need net. So we still need a local server that uh, application either uses or in campus, or the server uses uh, load the application, depends on the setting. And the server uh, talk to the browser, which has a web page, and the web page will use uh, HTTP uh, AJAX calls that uh, send the information to the server, and the server parses it, and the application handles it, and the application send back the response. It's really uh, kind of like uh, what you see in the uh, WPF application where there is a dispatcher. Uh, but there are a lot of uh, similar differences. And the uh, technology we're going to use is, first off, uh, it's based on HTTP uh, uh, communication because that's what uh, the web use. And also, uh, the web page is based on HTML and JavaScript with, with the AJAX calls. I think you need HTML5 and above, but I'm not sure. Or else you need a browser uh, to display the web page. So that's uh, that's one of the uh, issues. It, it makes uh, cross platform easier is because uh, nearly every uh, platform has a has somehow a browser capability, and we don't actually care. We, we consider that as a black box, so that we don't care how it displays to the user. We just care how the uh, web page will be like. And uh, C++ is for a a, a, a HTTP server. And I put Haskell there is because uh, I consider this uh, uh, a development tool rather than a uh, something made from the cross-platform uh, application. So we need a lot of parsers, either for for HTTP uh, message parsing or for the actual application parsing. So uh, it's uh, not really a great idea to write every single uh, message type and I mean, every single uh, uh, scenario, uh, one for uh, whether this is a message type and another for how to handle it. So Haskell is a, has a great way to uh, automate, gen, uh, automate the general process. Although this is uh, when compiling, in a compiling process, uh, but we're dealing with development uh, process. So if it, uh, uh, it's uh, another issue to consider it to make it into dynamic. So uh, here is the uh, HTTP format. I'm not sure if I uh, need to go through it because it's uh, relatively uh, well known. Uh, it's basically a, uh, I think, although uh, it is well known, uh, uh, HTTP 1, 2 has different models. One have uh, delimiter and two have length or something like that. So one is uh, delimiter based uh, for message passing, another is uh, Length based, but it's all in has uh, it's all in uh, axi uh, axi format. Axi uh, they all use axi chart set, uh, except the message body part. I I use it there. And uh, uh, here is how AJAX works. Now AJAX is a I believe a uh, a JavaScript call. The the it stands for asynchronous JavaScript. Uh, uh, XML HTTP request. And uh, what it does is, uh, if you're normally if you're uh, uh, visiting a page, if you're clicking on anything, or if you're interacting with anything, 
uh, normally it would take you to a different page, and then the uh, the browser will re-render -re the uh, the page, and that creates like a flash uh, response. We don't want that, and also we don't we don't want uh, the bro every time you do something the the browser. Uh, uh, reload the whole page. We, we want only the specific part of the page uh, where, where uh, the application want to change. So Ajax, what Ajax does is uh, simply it, it call this uh, method called XML HTTP request. It uh, uh, there are two parts in this. Uh, one is it create it send a HTTP request, which is a message to the server, and they register a event. Uh, it's a function so that when the uh, when there is a uh, uh, a state change, so that when uh, when when the response get back, it does something, and the and the, the request will be handled by a server, and the server will t will respond, and and the and the uh, JavaScript will will, will uh, call the function w which you uh, register. There may be a lot of cases for a typical application where you don't care. What the response is? Yes, and not uh, sending it a command. Yeah, but uh, if uh, yeah, that's I'm true. Not arguing with what you said. Also, in a, in a dispatcher uh, view, sometimes you don't even need a uh, AJAX call at all. But so this is a uh, demo. It just show how AJAX works. Uh, this is a HTML format. You can see, uh, it's basically saying that uh, there's a div called demo, and it has a header called uh, demo. Uh, the uh, XML HTTP request object as a button uh, called change text, and they, it has a load uh, doc function. And you can see here that uh, it simply uh, create a uh, create a AJAX call, change the fun uh, register function says if redis is four, that is twenty. Now the status is the response status, which is uh, in the HTTP. Uh, HTTP protocol, which means OK, I think. Uh, and uh, the uh, document get element by the demo, which is this. In the text is the whole thing inside the uh, tag, and it just says equals to response text. So it, it's waiting for a response. And here is already state change is every time the, uh, the response state might change. So it doesn't have to be uh, uh, getting a, a full response, but it could. But in, in, in this instance, it is. And they open a re request called get, and this is a server uh, a file, and uh, I think that uh, means it's it, uh, asynchronous. If it's full, uh, false, it means it blocks here. Uh, and uh, there's reason we do that, the same reason we have a dispatch, dispatcher in the WPF application, so that you don't click the button and the, the whole page freeze until the uh, response gets back. And they just send the uh, the just send the uh, uh, message, and then when it get back, it just uh, takes whatever it is in the response text and change it into this. So the, the 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 content will be changed. This is from the W three school tutorial, by the way. Oh, and this is the uh, the status is uh, two hundred. Okay, four 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 is page not found and. This is the uh, proper property for the Ajax call for his request finish and so on is ready. So uh, there are a lot of uh, parallels between uh, this kind of approach with the uh, WPF. Uh, for instance, the, you have a single thread for rendering. Uh, JavaScript is, I think it's inherently a sing, single threaded fun, but you can use Webmaster or some stuff like that. But you, those web workers can't talk to the DOM. Oh, yeah, that's true. Sure. But but you you can uh, there are uh, there are uh, a, a time event in DOM, uh, yeah. which you can kind of treat it as. Uh, so the timer is another little thread running. Yeah, yeah but not really because it, it it's not asynchronous, and there is also this separation between graphics and data routine. And what does that mean is we're dealing with WPF or uh, Android Studio. That uh, that's really just uh, several of those uh, three development tools that I've used. They all 
separate the graphics implementation between the, uh, the, uh, uh, the manipulation of data, for instance. In WPF, we have XAML, which describes the uh, GUI pretty nicely. And it's, uh, it's uh, XML uh, language, but it's uh, on a different format. And uh, in the Android Studio, we, have, uh, we directly use XML to describe the each page. And here, in this approach, the, we're directly using uh, HTML and uh, JavaScript to describe the page. So it, it has a similar par parallel here. And the data routine will be handled by the, uh, the server side there's application. The difference is it's distributed. So even though you're running on a local machine, the, the, the browser is still rendering by itself, and the server uh, running the uh, communica uh, communication by itself and the application doing the stuff by itself. So there are actually two instance uh, pages, uh, one in the uh, application, one on the uh, uh, browser. And uh, if, if it's uh, really cross the web, that makes the things complicated because uh, the user can actually change the JavaScript uh, and then uh, sending uh, different messages and that, that, that made this an actual distributed object and need, need, uh, need synchronization and safety issues uh, to uh, consider. Also, uh, browser has independent rendering. And that, <coughs> as I said, it, it, it rendered by itself. But it also means if it's not, it, if, it's, if the information doesn't have to be handled by the application, it can be handled by the browser itself. So for instance, if we have a graphic, uh, we have a data uh, visualization tool or a service, something like that. Uh, it doesn't, uh, the process itself doesn't need to be handled by the application. It can be just handled by browser. And the, if there's any change in the data itself, uh, the application will, change, uh, will handle that. And the browser handle it nicely. Oh, it depends on the browser. I mean, if you're using Internet Explorer, then that's not an issue. So uh, there are several uh, features, but also several flaws about this kind of approach. Uh, firstly, uh, as we said, we're doing uh, cross-platform because it's really uh, platform neutral. We, when, we're, when we're providing the web page, uh, HTML and JavaScript, it really, it really is not platform uh, specific, unless we're dealing with uh, different uh, like uh, mobile, we, we need to consider, or it, uh, a tablet, we might need to consider whether it's a uh, uh, screen size or it's uh, it, it not. Uh, there might not be a click event, and uh, it's structurally it is a web application, so it it is very easy to make it into a web web application, and also uh, in in some cases. Uh, you don't even need a uh, instance for uh, for the application for a different platform. For instance, uh, if you're on uh, if you're on Linux and you want to use the application in Windows, you can just host it on Windows and then use the web on the uh, uh, to uh, visit this uh, this service. But that makes it into a web application, and it actually is. It's just it inherently is, and it, there is no difference between the two in, in this approach. And browser independent rendering meaning that uh, uh, it's kind of like cloud, but really not. It it just means that we can exploit the 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 uh, browser's uh, 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 process to do its own thing rather than uh, doing everything in the in the uh, application side. Because uh, normally in a, in a GUI um, there is no uh, size normally. If, if it's about data changing, then, then we do it in the dispatcher. But if it's not, it's just, it's just in the thread or in the process itself. Here, there are actually two sides or three sides uh, if you're counting the server. So uh, there are two processes in play. And that depends on the browser. The browser can have a multiple pro process. It, it is distributed. And I consider that a flaw because uh, it's very easy to get a uh, third party attack or stuff or very easy to uh, change the uh, content so you send a uh, malice a message and then it, if, if, if not handled well 
to get the malice information back and the uh, the true instance on the. But if you're using this, so if the GUI is just being a uh, the rendering part of an application, a way to talk to an application. So you're you saying you have to go through the web. You know, it could be totally just one process talking to another process on your machine. So man in the middle can't ever get at it. I I uh, uh, I, I think of that, but uh, uh, one of the reasons. Uh,